Okay, y'all turn to Acts chapter 7. We're going to pick our study of the book of Acts back up. And before we do, I'll ask y'all, please keep Courtney and Bridget in your prayers. Both of them are um, sick. and So, yeah, you know that, I, I think it's whatever I had, that lung, whatever thing it is, it seems like it's going around. Lots of people have it right now. It could be, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, we thank you for the things that you've made known to us about yourself. Lord, we thank you for revealing these things through our Savior and by your Spirit in your Word. And so we come to you this morning asking for further revelation. Show us your nature, teach us of your goodness, and let us appreciate all your characteristics. Lord, help us to worship you this morning before we anything else. Help us to lift up our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in thanksgiving and in honor, and help us be led of the Spirit. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. <clears throat> In Revelation chapter 7. Revelation. <laughs> Acts chapter 7. <laughs> if y'all recall, um, we ended with Stephen. Stephen had, uh, you know, been brought before the court. And the last thing we read was that Stephen, as they're looking at him, his face reflected the glory of God. And remember, we tied that to Moses. When Moses brought a message from God, remember, his face shone. Everything in here is a testimony to these people. And what I want y'all to see today is that everything in here is basically like wrath. Because the wrath of God is going to come on this generation. Jesus Christ told them, this generation, and you don't need to play around with the word, it means that generation, all these things were going to come on. And what was the great penalty that they summed up all their sin with? They denied Christ and killed him. In Stephen's message today, I want you all to notice, there is not the single mention of Jesus and nothing about resurrection. Everything in here is going to be condemning these people, okay? And so as we come down through here, just remember that. Now, in verse 7 1, hey, how you doing? In uh, Acts 7 1, it says, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? Now remember what these things are. Let's go back and read them before we read. This is a long passage we're going to read, but I want you all to remember what he's being accused of. Go back to 6 11. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. In other words, he's talking against our religion, against Moses and God. Isn't it interesting they put Moses first, isn't it? It says, And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. So the second thing they bring out is the temple. Now I want you all to really think, what are they saying? He's attacking our religion. Our traditions that we got through Moses from God and our place. Now it says, we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered unto us. So when he asked, the high priest turns to Stephen and says, are these things so? What's he asking him? Are you preaching against Moses? And are you preaching against our temple? Right? Now really, what's he saying? Are you going against our religion? That's what he's saying, right? Okay, let's read the whole thing. It's a long passage, but I want to do it all together or it won't, it, it won't do it justice, okay? So let's read. Verse 2, And he, Stephen, said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Haran. Now, I'm going to quickly tell you all something. He's not reading from the Hebrew uh, received. In other words, he's not reading right now from the Hebrew Old Testament. He's doing like most New Testament writers. He's quoting from the Septuagint. And the Septuagint says just this. And we read in our version in in Genesis 12, 1, it says, God had said unto Abraham, Get thee out of thy country. So it all matches, right? But it says, He said unto him, to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and come into the land that I will show thee. 
Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him, he being God, removed him into this land wherein you now dwell. He gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet he had no child. You know the thing about Abraham that just really comes home as a type for me and you? All Abraham really possessed was the promise of God, and it was enough, wasn't it? He said, God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land, and that they should bring them into bondage, and entreat them evil four hundred years. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. After that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him, Abraham, the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac, and circumcised him the eighth day. Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. And he delivered him out of all his afflictions. He gave him favor and wisdom. Now, does that mean that Joseph's life was a bed of roses? No. He spent a long time in jail, didn't he? It means in all his afflictions, God was with him, right? He gave him uh, favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now there came a dearth or a famine over all the land of Egypt and Haran, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was corn in Egypt, he sent our fathers first. At the second time Joseph was made known to his brethren, and Joseph's kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. Then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him, and all all his kindred, three score and fifteen souls. Now there seems to be a discrepancy in the numbers there, but there's not. One is including Joseph and his kids, and the other's not when you read the other account. That's why the numbers are different. Now it says in 15. So Jacob went down into Egypt and died, he and our fathers. They all died in Egypt, none of them having received the promises. Now, what are the odds of us in this room? We're going to die not having received the promises. Now the Lord could come back and we won't die. We'll just be changed and receive them. But what's happened to every Christian since Stephen? They died not having received the promises. But what did every Christian do? Believe the promises. That's faith. That's faith and hope. Now he says, Jacob went down into Egypt, died, and our fathers. They were carried over in the Sikkim and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought, bought for a sum of money of the sons of Emer, the father of Sikkim. Remember they brought them back and buried them. When the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose which knew not Joseph. Can y'all see the sovereignty of God in all of this? Mm -hmm. Just making everything come out just like it's supposed to. He raised up a good Pharaoh and brought favor for Joseph to get him out, and now when it's time to deliver him, what does he do? He switches that Pharaoh out for a bad one and makes them want to be delivered. Hey, they wouldn't want to be delivered if everything was milk and uh, honey, would they? So he says, verse 19, The same king dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children to the end they might not live. Think about that. God changed the king over them until finally the people were compelled to kill their children. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. God has changed the leadership in our country until today. People are compelled to kill their children, aren't they? He says, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fair. Again, this is dealing with the Septuagint, right? What it's doing in between the Hebrew, the Septuagint, and the New Testament is it's telling us they knew there was something special about Moses, okay? It nourished, uh, he, uh, nourished him up in his father's house three months, and when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up. What's the odds? Huh? Forget the what's the odds. God's doing this. God's directing everything. It took him up and nourished him for her own son. Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. So later on when Moses makes excuses when God calls him, what do we know? Moses is trying to get out of it, isn't it? He was scared. Huh? He was scared. That's right. Just like us. Okay. It says, when he was a full 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel. That doesn't mean to just pop in on them and check on them. To visit means he wants to, he's concerned. He thinks it's time to deliver them. And when you read all the passages, you'll understand that. 
Seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. If you look at all the language, it's really fascinating. Moses punched this Egyptian and killed him. Moses must have been a strong man, huh? You know, at 120, he said his strength hadn't abated. He wasn't. Huh? Eyesight, he, God kept him strong. But anyway, he punched this guy and killed him. That has happened many times. Um, we, none of us could do it, but folks, I guarantee you Mike Tyson at 50-something years old could punch and kill you. Uh, really, if he hits you right at the right way. He says, verse 25, For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them. What's that tell us? Moses knew he was going to be the one God's going to use, didn't he? Well, where do you think he got that idea from? His parents, okay? Um, they understood not. And the next day he showed himself unto them as they strove and would have set them at one again, saying, Sirs, your brethren, why do you wrong one? He sees two Jews fight, and he says, Hey, what are you Israelites doing fighting your brothers? And he says, He that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Sounds a lot like we'll not have this man rule over us, doesn't it? And it says, the man says, Will thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? Uh-oh. Now Moses realized the cat's out the bag, isn't it? Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. When forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness a mount of Sinai, an angel of the Lord, and a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses trembled and durst not behold. Later Jesus Christ said that what God said that day proves that saved people don't die. They're living. He didn't say I was Abraham's God. He said I am. In other words where was Abraham at when this was said? He was with God. Okay. Verse 33, Then said the Lord to him, to Moses, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. I have seen, I have seen the affliction of my people which is in Egypt, and have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them, and now come, I will send thee into Egypt. This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. After that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness forty years. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, Here's a quote from Deuteronomy. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall you hear. Now who was that prophet Moses prophesied about? Christ. Okay, Peter makes it clear it's Christ. He says, this is he, Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake to him in Mount Sinai. Now, rather than the teaching that says, see, there's multiple churches in the Bible, that's not what this teaches. This teaches that out there in the wilderness, what was already there? The church. Why? Because the saints were there. How far back, according to Hebrews, does the church go? At least to Abel, doesn't it? And it would be my opinion, Adam and Eve also, the way the Lord dealt with them. But anyway. He said he dealt with them at Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively or living oracles to give unto us, to whom our fathers would not obey. Wouldn't obey Moses, would they? Did they see Moses' face shine from being in God's presence? And then what did they do? Refused to follow him. Do you all see the parallel here? Stephen's face shining like this, and what are they going to do to him? Kill him. It says, They thrust him from them, and their hearts turned back again to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. For as for this Moses, can't y'all hear the contempt in that? This Moses, which brought us out of the land of Egypt, we what not as become of him. And they made a calf in those days, and offered sacrifice unto the idol, rejoiced in the work of their own hands, now this is why we sung, why I pick Rock of Ages, nothing in my hands I bring. You'll find that the work of their own hands is the phrase in the Septuagint for an idol. What is an idol? The work of men's hands. And we're, we're going to get into this later, but aren't we all bent to want to lean back and return to trusting the work of our own hands? And this is that what they're doing. So he says, then God turned and gave them up. 
You know, we're living in a nation right now that according to Romans 1 has been given up. When God gives a people up, what does He do? He says, that's it, I'm doing no more restraints and let their sin just take off. Me and Gina were just talking. Are y'all not surprised at how rapidly stuff's changing? He, I had a waitress or a waiter yesterday, I don't know which. My friend had an in, inkling of what it was, so insisted on, kept calling it ma'am, and it kept getting mad. And all. You wouldn't have made me believe. Five years ago, I'd have never believed that. It's crazy, isn't it? It's, but it's happening everywhere, isn't it? It says... Um, uh, God gave them up to worship the host of heaven, the sun, moon, and stars, as it is written in the book of the prophets. O you house of Israel, have you offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of 40 years in the wilderness? In other words, did God have real pleasure in their sacrifices? No, He wanted obedience. And what did they offer with their sacrifice? Disobedience. Why they give the sacrifice on one hand in their religious system, they turn around and worship the sun, moon, and stars, don't they? How many people are going to dedicate an hour to God this morning somewhere, and then they're going to leave and return right back to the world and won't give God another thought till next Sunday morning? It's the same thing, folks. He says, Ye took up the tabernacle of Moloch and the star of your god Remphan. That comes from the Jewish historical books. They gave names to the sun. and to, It's just the same paganism. It's worshiping the sun, moon, and stars. Figures which you made to worship them, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness. Didn't God give them the tabernacle out there? It says, As he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus, that's Joshua, into the possession of the Gentiles, whom God drave out before the face of our fathers under the days of David. Aren't y'all interested at how Stephen is going through the whole history of this nation? And do you know what he's pointing out to them? It's a history of rejecting God's messengers and, and turning to idols, isn't it? And what are they doing to Stephen? The same thing. The only difference is, what is the idol they're preferring in Stephen's day? their religion, their temple, and their traditions. So he says, uh, David, who found favor before God uh, and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob, but Solomon built him a house, how be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Did the Old Testament say the Lord doesn't dwell in temples made with hands? Yes. Did He let a representation of His glory dwell in there for a symbol? Yes. Why would Jesus Christ ever need a temple in Jerusalem? He don't, folks. Now, whatever they do over there, they might do, but don't you put your trust or interest in it, okay? He says... Um, as saith the prophet, verse 49, Heaven is my throne. Here's what Isaiah said in the Old Testament. God said, Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What house will you build me? Doesn't that put an end to it? Well, what did Jesus Christ verify? He told them, he said, this place... Y'all remember, even the apostles were prone to worship the temple. As they're leaving out the last week of his life, the last time the Lord leaves the temple, one of the last times, they turn and say, Look at this building, remember? And what did the Lord tell them? There's not going to be one stone left here upon another. Folks, God so completely demolished that idol that he did like Moses did. Moses takes the, the calf, grinds it into powder, and disperses it, doesn't he? Matter of fact, he made them drink it, if you remember. What's going to happen to this temple? The whole system of Judaism is going to be destroyed and scattered in the world. He says, verse 50, Hath not my hands made all these things? Now watch the, the conclusion. Here's Stephen accusing this generation. You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. That's the point of his sermon. You are repeating the history of our nation. Now, would they even consider that? Y'all know we have a famous saying. Everybody knows. If you don't learn from history, what happens? You repeat. Isn't that what Israel's been doing? They're doing it right now as we speak. He said, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? He's saying, look, y'all are ready to kill me for my message. Does that sound familiar? What prophet did y'all not want to kill? He said, And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom you have now been betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it. 
Now, we're going to save Stephen's death for the next time, but I wanted to read all that together, and let's go over what he's doing because this is very important. Um, I read one commentator that said this, that Stephen's sermon goes on and on and is basically long-winded and pointless. And I thought to myself, what? Huh? Even if we didn't understand anything about it, would you say that about anything in the Word of God? No, no it's not only disrespectful, it, it, it's arrogant to the point of if I don't understand it or get something from it, well, then there's nothing in it. What the writer should have said is, you know, this still escapes me. I'm not going to write on it right now. Let me go to chapter 8. And you'll find many honest commentators say things like that. Matthew Henry, one of the greatest that ever lived, said things like this. You know, I'm not too certain about this. If God gives us more light later on this, isn't that easy? You don't need to be uh, trying to make anybody think you understand all things. Nobody does. All right, so once again, what are the two points that Stephen's got to dispel? Blasphemy. Now, they add God. But I'm going to tell you the real thing that they're mad about in here is blasphemy against Judaism. Isn't it? Yeah. Oh, what were they always mad at Jesus about? Their traditions. Jesus never once broke the law. But they said, why do your disciples don't wash their hands before you eat according to our traditions? Did Moses' law say that? Why are they plucking wheat on the Sabbath day? We're not allowed to do that. Did Moses' law say that? Why are they traveling this distance? They had all their traditions they added. I can remember growing up and being told I was going to hell because I didn't do this when I passed the cemetery. Where's that at? It's the same thing, isn't it? It is the same thing. I have people today that say things to me like this. You don't rightly divide, therefore you're going to hell. Seriously, that's what people make the, the mark on. Uh, I had a, a, a woman who said that to me literally in those, those words, you know, send me a text this week asking me to pray for somebody. And my first thought is, why would you want a lost heathen to pray for somebody? <laughs> it's kind of odd, isn't it? So they're gonna, he's going to defend against the charge that he's blaspheming against the traditions. Now, they call the traditions Moses. But what they say is Moses and the traditions are the same. Stephen's going to say, no, it ain't. Just like Jesus Christ said, it's not, right? But then the other thing is they said they're blaspheming against the temple. Now, look, that's nothing more than to say this. Our religion. And that word religion, we've talked about this before, but it comes from two words in Latin, re, do again, right? And ligo, to bind. The word means to bind back again. And what the word in its most simple meaning is this, that it's what people do to reconcile their self to God. Whatever God they worship, they recognize their sin has, God's mad. And so what, they do various things to bind themselves back to God. Now, that's what paganism is, isn't it? I've told you all the story I read about the um, man that went to, famous preacher went to visit a missionary that his church supported over in Bangladesh or China or somewhere. And when they got on the boat to go down river, the little fellow that was driving the boat before they left killed a chicken and poured the blood all over the front of the boat. And the preacher said to the missionary, what is he doing? He said, he's pacifying the God of the river so that we have safe passage. That, that's what they do. They sacrifice to gods to placate an angry God. What could me and you do to placate an angry, righteous God? What's the only thing that can placate a righteous God? Righteousness. Then who's the only one that can placate a righteous God? Righteous God. Okay, that's the whole point. That's what Christianity teaches. Okay, now they're talking ill of these things. That's the charges. Now, Stephen again doesn't say the name Jesus nor refer to his resurrection at all. There, was there anything in there that led y'all believe that he was telling them to repent and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? No. Why was he not preaching that? Who needs to repent? Guilty people. Did they think they were guilty? So, what is he doing? He's doing exactly what the law was designed to do to show guilt, isn't it? The Jews took the law and turned it into a system of worship. Stephen's taking the law and cutting them with it. I mean, y'all think about it. He's really laying into them, isn't he? Y'all go to John 5. 
Folks, this, this, there's some finality in this statement with Stephen. There really is. And I, look, I'm not going to say, hey, here's the point and this changes here and all. But with the death of Stephen, it's an official choice that they make by their council. That's like their senate. And it's like, it's literally like strike three. I mean, from this point forward, things are going to start to change rapidly because as soon as Stephen is killed, Saul's entered into the picture. Where's he going to go? to the Gentiles. Not a new message, but in a new direction. But between his conversion, we get the gospel going out. It goes out into Judea and Samaria. We get the Ethiopian eunuch comes into it. He's going to go back to Ethiopia. In other words, you're seeing there's something happening here. The Jews are rejecting Christ nationally, and it's like this is judgment on them. And the Lord gives them literally 40 years from the time, one generation, and what happened to them? They destroyed. According to Josephus, and look, we don't know how accurate it is, but it, it's, he was there. 1.1 million Jews died in Jerusalem, and 90,000 went into slavery. And what happened to the city of Jerusalem? It was destroyed. Folks, they plowed salt into the ground so nothing would grow there. Not one stone was left upon another in the temple. And, you know, I've heard people say, what would make soldiers tear down stones? What was on the inside of those stones? Gold and silver on the inside. Okay? It, God fixed it so that they did. They did exactly what Jesus Christ said. Okay? Now, in uh, John 5, 39, Jesus tells the Jews this. Search the Scriptures. Now, what's the only Scriptures they had? Search the Scriptures, he says, for in them you think you have eternal life. So he says, you think you understand the Scriptures, right? He said, they are they which testify of me. Boy, there's the understanding of the Old Testament, isn't it? You think you've got it figured out, but you don't know it's talking about me. That's why a Jew today is completely blind. I don't care how strongly he studies his Old Testament, he is completely blind. The, the most simple Christian in the world, some little 12-year-old girl that just saw the truth knows more than the lost Jew today. I've told you all many times the worst person in the world to teach you the Old Testament is a lost Jewish rabbi. Because, not because he's dumb, he's not dumb, he's very intelligent. He doesn't know the truth, but he thinks he knows everything. Now that's the worst person, isn't it? I'm, I'm going to use an example. I, Gina won't mind, I know, but um, my mom read, I mean, a book a week, Gina, just... Easy. Easy. Just thousands upon thousands of books in her life, literally. Gave away, when she died, she had a whole library. She was, that was her thing all her life, right? When I was in high school, I had to read and study Edgar Allan Poe, The Raven. Remember, Hark, The Raven Nevermore? Okay. And I went home and I read it. And I had no idea what it was talking about. Did y'all? No. I'm looking at him like, what? And in comes my mom who's going to college and she's, you know, she knows it all, yes. And I said, I have no idea what this is about. She said, I'll be right back. And she come in and sat down and explained it to me. Just went through the whole nine yards and explained it to me. And I thought, wow, that really, that, that's it, that sounded good. I went to school the next day, and I had a teacher. And it, he was a very special teacher. Anybody that had him usually remembers him, Mr. Coleman. And Mr. Coleman taught me how to tie a tie. Every time I tie a tie, I think about him. He wore a tie every day to school. He, look, I'll tell y'all, he was, he was a little light in loafers. <laughs> I'm not endorsing that, but what I'm telling y'all is he was a great teacher. And he was a good friend, real good friend of our family. But he wore a tie every day that was impeccable. And so he taught me how to tie, tie a tie. I, I don't remember how to do. He taught me several. One of them was this double Windsor. I forgot how to do it. But anyway, he was a really nice man, but he was an incredible teacher. He really was. When I got to class that day, I thought I knew it all. And I was just sitting on the edge waiting on him to say, what's this all about? And he said it. Man, I raised my hand. And boy, I started talking. And I explained the whole 
whole thing to him, and I sat back, and I, I had the same look, Gina, you know. And he said, well, Mr. Clemens, that was uh, very nice. That was also a complete waste of everyone's time. <laughs> and he said, now, let's start. And he started in verse, the first word, and he started to break it down. I thought I knew everything about it, and you know what he showed me? I didn't know nothing. Folks, he went into it. I had no idea what a brilliant man Edgar Allan Poe was, even though he was nuts. Every syllable was chosen for certain things. All the vowels he chose were to, were to bring gloom. Ooh, you know, that's a, and he went through this thing, and when I left the class that day, I realized something. Boy, I really didn't know anything. This is the position of the Jews. They thought they knew everything. And Stephen himself is going to show them, you got no idea. And Jesus is telling them this, you don't know what you're talking about. So he says to them in uh, verse uh, 40, you will not come to me that you might have life. You know why the Pharisees weren't going to come to Jesus? To come to him would admit they didn't know that they needed healing, that they were unrighteous. They're not going to admit that. He said, I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you know, have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. And boy, they do, don't they? He said, how can you believe which receive honor one of another? Was God's honor their desire? No. He says, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Jesus said, I'm not going to accuse you. There is, already is one that accuseth, present tense, accuseth you even Moses in whom you trust. He said to them, right now as I'm speaking to you, you are condemned to hell and it's Moses that's condemning you. The law condemns, doesn't it? And what is Stephen going to use? The law. And what does he do to that generation? He condemns them. I mean, he condemns them flatly, okay? Um, you know, in Romans uh, 2, Paul said that the, uh, the law, to the man that has the law, he'll be judged by the law. He said to the one that doesn't have the law that's lost will be judged by the law in his conscience. But to the one that has the law, he'll be judged by it, won't he? Stephen just takes their own law and judges them, doesn't he? Now, the last thing Christ says in 46, he said, Had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Mm -hmm. Moses, he said, was writing about me. So when we go back to the Old Testament, we read, everything we're reading back there is pointing us to show us God is going to bring redemption in His Son, isn't He? And this is what Stephen does. Okay, now Stephen's sermon, he's going to go against these two accusations. But I want you all to look at the people that he chooses. He's going to choose to use these people. Abraham. Well, that would certainly hit home with a Jew, wouldn't it? He's going to then use Joseph. Boy, that would hit home with him, wouldn't it? And when he gets done with Joseph, he's going to Moses. Now you're really hitting him in the bread basket, aren't you? And when he gets done with Moses, he goes to David and Solomon. Now, are those people that the Jews were familiar with? Yeah. But what truth did they know about them? Nothing. They knew the history, but they didn't know the redemptive typology in it. They didn't see Christ in it. Okay? So let's start with the first one. All right? This is a great commentary on the Old Testament. Okay? It's not that the natural man is just lacking someone to give them the information. This is what people tend to think, that the whole world is ready to be saved, they just haven't received the information. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the whole world is lost, wants to be lost, is blind, is happy being blind, and unless God opens their eyes, they'll never see a thing. Didn't the Jews have the truth right in front of them? Did they see it? No. This is, I mean, this is just so, so blatant that folks if God doesn't open our heart and mind me and you're not going to see it you will not see it okay all right the, the natural man also is this condition he's blind and he doesn't know it now how can you be worse off than that blind and don't know it it's almost like the emperor's new clothes somebody come along and told the emperor hey you're naked didn't they what does the world need to be told you, and I tell you, when you come at them, you, what you need to say is, we are all 
guilty and headed to hell by nature, okay? So um, he's at enmity with God. That's the lost man's problem is he needs to be reconciled to God. Then I said this in class once and I got a surprise look, but I'll say it again. What does mankind need saving from? from God. It's a holy and righteous God who's going to judge sin. He said, I have appointed a day. All ungodliness and unrighteousness is going to be paid for, isn't it? Then where does that leave every man? I got to find out, figure out a way to pay it. I've got to be reconciled to God and we can't reconcile ourselves. And so what happens? They invent religions of how to bind themselves back to God. No religion can do it. The only religion that even does teaches anything different than something you do to gain better. You know, every religion out there is how you can improve from life to life and whatnot. The only one out there that says that God Almighty has done something to fix the problem is biblical Christianity. Okay? Now, um, all right, the Jews were trusting, I'm going to use this phrase, church membership, weren't they? Yeah. When Jesus come to them and preached to them that they needed to be delivered, you remember what they said? Delivered from bondage, we're not in bondage. We're Abraham's seed. In other words, we're church people. We're, we're in the Jewish church. Hey, we're part of the temple. We've got the religion. You're talking about the Gentiles on the outside. So literally, they're churching, trusting their church membership. Y'all go back to Jeremiah 7. This is nothing new, by the way. This is what they had done from almost the beginning. I'll say shortly after Joshua uh, and that generation died, they descended quickly in the book of Judges. All right. <clears throat> the two people that God used, the two prophets that God used to judge Judah, okay, when Judah was about to go into captivity for their idolatry. The two main prophets were Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Jeremiah mostly in the land and Ezekiel mostly in Babylon, okay? But that's the two. And both of them said the same thing. But watch what Jeremiah says about the people. 7-1. Uh, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, <clears throat> Stand in the gate of the Lord's house, the temple, and proclaim there this word, and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. What's the first thing he tells them? You got to change, you got to repent. And yet, where are they at? In the temple. You see the problem? They're, they're claiming to worship God, and no, they need to repent. He says, Trust you not in lying words, saying, The temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. Now, basically what that means is, they said, Nothing can happen to us. We've got the temple. God dwells here. The city, Jer they said Jerusalem could never fall because the temple's there. What did they think the temple was? <laughs> They're putting their trust in the temple. They, their assurance was that they had the temple, wasn't it? He said, For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between man and his neighbor, if you oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, he says, If you shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after, after other gods to your hurt, then will I cause you to dwell in this place, in the land that I gave to your fathers forever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Now what were the preachers preaching to the Judah at this time? Jeremiah comes to him and he says basically this, it's almost here. We have turned from God and worshipped the idols, and now the wrath of God's falling on us, and it's about to drop the hammer on Jerusalem. And what did the false prophet say? Peace, peace. They said something along these lines. No, that can't happen here. That's meant for everybody else, but we're the special people of God. We can never go through any of that tribulation. Now, does that sound familiar? What's the whole Christian world right now believing? They're believing that out of Hollywood. Literally, they're believing what LaHaye says out of Hollywood that, you know, that can't happen to us. Folks, what did the, this is the church always been in? 
in this world persecuted and in tribulation. You and I are in about the worst spiritual tribulation that's ever existed. Have y'all ever known a time when the worldly system was more dangerous than it is right now? We're led into, into worldly idolatry with every thought, just literally, aren't we? And so he's telling them, don't believe what the false teachers are telling you. And the false teachers were telling them, as long as we've got the temple, we're fine. You know how many people today you ask, are you saved? And you know what their next answer will be? Well, I go to such and such church. Okay. What's it matter? It doesn't matter. Church membership doesn't save you. Baptism doesn't save you. It might put you in a local assembly in their eyes, but it won't save you. Okay? Neither can a man not be saved if he's not in there. There's people saved that aren't in a physical assembly somewhere. Look, we've got a lot of people that watch online that have tried everywhere they can to find some people to worship with and can't. They go to no matter church after church, and guess what they find out? There's no gospel. I mean, that's sad, isn't it? Literally, in a spiritual sense, we're bouncing around in caves and dens, and I mean, that's where the church has come to. Okay, so he says this to them, and what they're doing is they're trusting the temple as their assurance. Now think about it. God is dwelling in that temple. Nothing can happen to us. And yet what's the real truth? The truth is if you're saved, the Spirit of God's dwelling in you and nothing can happen to you eternally. You can never perish. Now you can suffer, but you can never perish. See, they're doing what the Jews always did. They're missing the spiritual truth because they're staring at the natural, aren't they? All right, so there, here's where we are. Now, flip back over to Acts 7 again. <clears throat> you know, I said earlier that we are always tending back to somebody is just blowing my phone up, Lexine. That's all right, I'll, I'll get it after class. Okay. Um, we are always tending, right? Tending towards going back to trusting ourselves, aren't we? Yeah. Aren't we always leaning towards believing our works? Hey, look, it's one of the reasons you have to be careful when you're teaching sanctification because sanctification is what God is doing in us, but all of a sudden you and I believe that because of our good works, we're sanctifying ourselves. We're not. Yeah. And none of those things are true. So we're always in danger of that, okay? Hey, Sienna, can you bring my phone to Lexi, please? Thank you. Huh? Somebody just told me that's what kept me awake last night. <laughs> what, that, yeah, it is, isn't it? Y'all yeah. know we are always that way. Because we're that way naturally, Satan is able to come and cause us to doubt when we commit sin. Because we tend to lean back quickly to trusting our works, don't we? Now, the Jews are in this position. And they're also, they console themselves by saying, but we've got the temple. The temple is the proof that we're approved of God, right? So, in uh, Acts 7, verse 48, Stephen makes what really is a... Uh, a stunning statement, verse 48. How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now look, that phrase again, I'm going to tell you all. Made with hands is the phrase in the Septuagint for an idol. Now this is the Bible that most of them understood. Certainly the people Stephen is from. Stephen was a Grecian. And so when you talk about that which is made with hands, it's an idol. And what he's basically saying is God doesn't dwell in an idol. You know, you read the Old Testament, God said, it's wood and stone. You know, the prophet said, how stupid can you be? You go out and you chop down a tree. You bring it in and you fix it up and layer it with gold. And there are people that have turned that into a Christmas tree. Are you all aware of that? There was a lady in the church me and Wayne went to that told me that. Your Christmas tree, you, you, you know, you're going to go there. Folks, if you worship a Christmas tree, yeah, you got a problem. But come on, it's a, it's a silly tradition, okay? That particular thing in Jeremiah 10 is not dealing with a Christmas tree unless you're worshiping it. It's dealing with an idol. He says, look, a man goes out and chops down a tree, right? He cuts him one section about this long and sets it aside. The rest of it he splits for firewood and burns, cooks his meals on it. And then he takes the one piece and carves something, dips it in gold to give it value and sets it on his mantle and worships it. And the prophet said, how stupid can you be? You're worshiping this piece and the other piece you burnt your supper over. 
Isn't that silly? It's something they can see. Trust. It is something they can see. They naturally needed it. And that's what they had turned the temple into. What was the temple made of? <laughs> Folks, just about everything in the temple was wood overlaid with gold. Yeah. Now, God told them to do that. But what did it symbolize later? It became their idol. Yeah. Okay, that's what it became. All right, so um, when, when he's telling them these things that God dwelleth not in temples made with hands, if he didn't dwell in a temple made with hands in the Old Testament, what would make you think he would today? No. Now, the people that say he's going to return to the Old Testament in the future, did he literally dwell in a temple in the Old Testament? No. He said in the Old Testament, heaven is my throne and the earth's my footstool. Then how would it be a return to his former dwelling to go back to the temple in Jerusalem if he never dwelt there to begin with? All he had dwelled there was a symbol of his glory. Okay, <clears throat> So be careful of those things. Now, um, one other thing to say, and then we're going to take a break, is um, never forget who it was that killed Jesus Christ. It was devout Temple attending Jews. In other words, who killed Jesus Christ? Professing religious people. Not the, not the, the you know, the Romans carried it out, but they could care less. Who is it that persecutes the Christians? False Christians, folks, always. I, every time I have ever been called something nasty or dirty or said, somebody said stuff about me that's not true, first thing I think is, look, I can tell you things about me that are worse than that if you want to know. That's not even one. But they say stuff that aren't even true, but look who it is that says it. It'll be somebody professing to be a Christian because tares are always attacking wheat. And it's the same here. The people that killed Jesus Christ were the most religious professing people that lived on earth at that time. And never forget that, okay? All right, let's take a break. When we come back, we'll pick up with the second part. I always thought it was the bad guys. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It is true that you killed 